Good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to begin by uh, saying uh, what a pleasure it was uh, for me to meet with Prime Minister May and congratulate her on becoming Prime Minister. We've had occasion to uh, be together before in, in uh, other settings, but this is the first time that uh, I had a chance to address her as Madam Prime Minister. Uh, I'm glad that uh, Teresa and I could meet early in her tenure. The Prime Minister continues to be a steadying influence during a time of transition. Uh, it was a wide-ranging conversation, but it began with the basic premise that uh, even as the UK pursues an orderly exit from the EU, uh, together we reaffirm uh, the very special relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, it will not simply endure, but it will continue to grow stronger with time. Uh, the vibrant economic partnership between our countries will continue as the UK gains further clarity on its new relationship with the EU. Our two countries will be discussing uh, ways in which we continue to sustain uh, and strengthen our trade and investment ties. Here at the G20, we will continue to pursue an agenda of inclusive and sustainable growth. When it comes to security issues, uh, under Prime Minister May, the UK has reaffirmed its strong commitment to the transatlantic uh, security architecture. Uh, we are NATO allies. We see the world uh, in the same way. We will continue to oppose Russian aggression in Ukraine. We will continue to counter cyber threats. We will continue to work diligently to root out terrorist networks and will work to destroy ISIL. Uh, at a time when the international is or, uh, order is under strain, uh, I also emphasize the degree to which uh, United Kingdom's leadership on the world stage is essential. Uh, we are grateful for the UK's indispensable role in achieving landmark uh, agreements on climate change, on issues of energy security and global development. We will continue to count on uh, being able to stand together, stand strong with our British friends uh, to make sure that international norms and rules uh, are enforced and are maintained. The bottom line is, is that we don't have a stronger partner uh, anywhere in the world uh, than uh, the United Kingdom. And uh, despite uh, you know, the turbulence of uh, political events over the last several months, uh, we have every intention to making sure that that continues. And so uh, I look forward to uh, our partnership. This is my last G20, uh, Teresa's first, uh, but uh, the continuity of the relationship between the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, that stretches back uh, many decades, and it will continue uh, for many decades to come. Teresa. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm very pleased to be here at my first G20 summit and, and pleased to have had the opportunity to meet you, Barack. And as you say, the United States is a special partner for the United Kingdom, a long-standing ally and a close friend. We share the same values of freedom, openness, and tolerance. We share intelligence and technology. Our troops train, fight, and recuperate together. And together, we do more together than any other two countries in the world. And I think that's as true now as it has ever been. And our discussions today have been wide-ranging. We've focused on Brexit, on the threat from Daesh, the situation in Syria, and on the need to do more to solve the migration crisis. Uh, I'd just like to say a few words on each of those. First, we have talked about Britain's decision to leave the European Union, the process now and what Brexit means for the UK's relationships with our European friends, but with other countries too. The UK has always been a strong partner for the US and that will remain the case. We have a thriving economic relationship. British businesses export twice as much to the United States as they do to our next largest market. And the United States is the largest inward investor in Britain with total American investments providing more than one million jobs. We need to build on that strong foundation as the UK leaves the EU. We're both strong supporters of free trade. Uh, and today we've discussed how to take forward consultations to ensure that the UK and US have the strongest possible trading relationship. And this reinforces my belief that as we forge a new glo global role for the UK, we can and will seize the opportunities that Brexit presents and make a success of it. 
We've also discussed the threat from Islamist terrorism. The UK and the US have been at the forefront of efforts to defeat Daesh in Iraq and Syria, and it's vital that we take action to degrade Daesh abroad to help keep the streets of Britain safe. And the coalition is making progress. Daesh is losing territory in Iraq and Syria. Its finances have been hit, its leaders are being killed, and fighters are deserting. And in recent weeks, thanks to US efforts, Daesh in Libya have been forced backwards too. But we must not be complacent. We know these terrorists are intent on destroying our way of life, and the threat in the UK remains severe. So as we drive Daesh out of one area, we must be alert to the risk that they will seek a safe haven elsewhere, and we must work internationally to defeat their ideology of hatred and murder. And we need to support other countries in the region, helping to protect them from the threat of Daesh, and thereby protecting people home in Britain too. We must also continue to strive for a political situation in Syria. The goal remains a negotiated settlement which delivers stability for all Syrians and a government with whom we can work to defeat the terrorists. We welcome US efforts to broker an end to the violence and to help protect moderate opposition forces. It's vital that humanitarian supplies get to innocent Syrians who are in desperate need. And this afternoon, I will urge President Putin to do all he can to get the aid convoys in and to end the indiscriminate bombing of civilians. And next week, the Foreign Secretary plans to host the moderate Syrian opposition in London as we continue to support their hopes for a democratic, peaceful and inclusive Syria. And finally, we discuss the global migration crisis. Across the world, there are now over 244 million migrants, 65 million displaced people, and over 20 million refugees. This growing crisis cannot be solved by the actions of one country alone. We need an international approach which better identifies those refugees who most need support, deals more effectively with economic migrants, and does more to address the root causes of migration. This issue will be top of the agenda at the UN General Assembly later this month, and I hope we can make concrete progress to stem the flow of migration and help people in their home countries and regions. So we've had a productive meeting. It's been an opportunity to discuss how we respond to some of the great challenges we face. And I look forward to continuing our discussions at the summit, particularly on the global economy. We understand that many of our citizens are frustrated by the pace of globalization and feel they're not experiencing the benefits of international trade. We both believe this is an issue that we as G20 leaders cannot afford to ignore. Instead, we must all work together to spur economic growth, to boost free trade, and build a fairer economy that truly works for all. Thank you. So we're going to take a couple of questions, starting with Andrew Beatty of AFP. Um, I had a question on Syria, first of all. It seems like there's a deal with the Russians within reach. I was wondering, do you not think there's a risk that there's another short-lived agreement that doesn't end the war, but which allows the Russians to deflect criticism at the G20 here and at the UN General Assembly? And secondly, uh, what do you make of the kerfuffle yesterday at the airport? And for the Prime Minister, um, you said that Brexit means Brexit, but I wonder if you could be a bit more specific. Could you categorically rule out the UK staying within the EU? Thank you. With respect to Syria, we have long been interested in finding a way to reduce the violence, improve humanitarian access on the ground as a precursor for a political transition inside of Syria. Now, it is a very complicated piece of business. Uh, you have uh, the Assad regime, which has been killing its own citizens with impunity, uh, supported by the Russians and the Iranians. Uh, you have a moderate opposition that has uh, continuously tried to consolidate a position that would lead to uh, a inclusive and representative government, but is often outgunned. Then you have ISIL and you have uh, al-Qaeda uh, in the form of Nusra on the ground as well, and a range of other players from the Turks and uh, the Gulf states uh, to the Kurds trying to corral all of those different forces into a coherent structure for negotiations is difficult. Uh, but 
our conversations with the Russians are key because if it were not for the Russians, then Assad uh, and the regime uh, would uh, not be able to sustain uh, its offensive. And these are difficult negotiations. We have grave differences with the Russians in terms of both uh, the parties we support, but also the process uh, that's required to bring about peace in Syria. But if, if we do not get some buy-in from the Russians uh, on reducing the violence and easing the humanitarian crisis, then it's difficult to see how we get to the next phase. Uh, so John Kerry and, and uh, his counterpart, Sergei uh, Lavrov, have been working uh, around the clock, as well as a number of other negotiators, to see what would a real cessation of hostilities look like that could provide that humanitarian access and provide uh, people uh, in places like Aleppo relief. We're not there yet. Uh, and you know, understandably, given the previous failures of cessations of hostilities to hold, um, you know, we approach it with some skepticism. But it is worth trying. Uh, you know, to the extent that there are children and women and uh, innocent civilians who can get food and medical supplies and uh, you know, get some relief from the constant terror of uh, bombings, uh, that's, that's worth the effort. And uh, I think it's, it's premature for us to say that there is a clear path forward, uh, but uh, you know, th there's the possibility, at least, for us to uh, make some progress on that front. In addition, I should point out that the UN uh, uh, Special Rep, uh, Stefan de Mistura, has been also coming up with a longer-term structure for uh, a political transition. Uh, we are supporting his efforts as well, uh, and those two things uh, hopefully can operate in, uh, in tandem. Uh, and the last point I would make is that none of this is slowing down our very aggressive efforts against ISIL. Uh, as, as we've seen in recent weeks, not only have we been able to clear out ISIL from additional territory inside of Syria as well as Iraq, uh, but we continue to systematically go after uh, their leadership, uh, including their head of op uh, external operations uh, and probably the second most prominent person uh, in the ISIL infrastructure. Uh, so uh, none of this is slowing down a very aggressive effort uh, to go after what uh, I think we all consider to be a, a the principal threat uh, that's emanating out of Syria. Uh, and with respect to uh, uh, our visit here, uh, so far it's been extraordinarily uh, productive. Uh, it is true that uh, not for the first time when we come here, there ends up being issues around uh, security and press access. Um, and part of the reason is because we insist on a certain approach to uh, our press pool, for example, that other countries may not insist on. Uh, you know, we think it's important that the press have access to uh, uh, the work that we're doing, uh, that they have the ability to answer questions. And uh, you know, we don't leave our values and ideals behind when we take these trips, uh, it can cause some friction. Uh, it, it's not the first time it's happened. Uh, it doesn't just happen in China. It happens in other countries where uh, we travel. Uh, I think this time maybe, the, as uh, Josh put it, the seams are showing a little more uh, than, than usual in terms of some of the negotiations and jostling that takes place um, behind the scenes. And in fairness, you know, when delegations travel to the United States, uh, sometimes there are issues about our security procedures and protocols that they're uh, aggravated with but uh, don't always get reported on. Uh, but none of this detracts from uh, the broader uh, scope of the relationship. Uh, as we saw yesterday, President Xi and I uh, continued what has been a historic uh, joint project to elevate uh, climate change issues. 
Um, the bilateral discussions that we had yesterday were, were extremely productive and uh, continue to point to big areas of cooperation. Uh, when I bring up issues like human rights, uh, you know, there are some tensions there that uh, perhaps don't take place when uh, President Xi meets with other uh, leaders, but that's part of our job. That's part of what we do. And uh, so, so I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't over crank the uh, significance of it, uh, because as I said, th this is not the first time uh, that these things happen, and it doesn't just happen here. It happens in a lot of places, including, by the way, sometimes uh, our allies. Part of it is we also have a, a much bigger footprint um, than a lot of other countries. Um, and, uh, you know, we got a lot of planes and a lot of helicopters and a lot of cars and a lot of guys. And, uh, you know, if you're a host country, sometimes it, it may feel a little bit much. Um, I, I, you, know, you notice some chortling among uh, the, 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 the Brits. Uh, you know, they probably find it a little overwhelming as well. Um, so, uh, I, 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 but, but, but the one thing I, I will say is, is we don't make apologies for uh, pushing a little bit harder when it comes to press access. Uh, and that's been the case from my very first uh, state visit here. Um, and, and we don't always get everything that we'd like to see, but we think it's important for us to at least uh, stand up for those values. And on the uh, question you asked me about Brexit, yes, Brexit does indeed mean Brexit. On the 23rd of June, the people in the UK voted for the UK to leave the European Union. The government respects that decision. We respect the wishes of the people, and we will put that into practice. So there'll be no second referendum, no attempt to turn the clock back, no attempt to try and get out of this. The UK will be leaving the European Union. Uh, I think we have a question from Jason Groves from the Daily Mail. Hi, it's Jason Groves from the Daily Mail. Um, Mr. President, you came to London earlier this year and urged the British people not to vote for Brexit and warn them that they'd be at the back of the queue for a trade deal if they did. Do you accept you got it wrong on Brexit and do you regret making that threat or, or are you really going to punish uh, us for taking a democratic decision? And could I ask just quickly, I work for the Daily Mail. Uh, and could I ask just quickly uh, whether you've got any advice for uh, the Prime Minister this autumn when she's got the uh, uh, pleasure of hosting Donald Trump in London? Um, Prime Minister, can I ask whether you've had any trade reassurances uh, from uh, the President about your place in his queue? Um, and could I also ask you quickly uh, about Hinckley Point, which we'll be discussing with President Xi tomorrow. You've said you'll look at all the evidence. Does that include getting the National Security Council to look at the potential security implications? On the, uh, on the first point that you raised, uh, Jason, I mean, we've had uh, discussions about the importance of the trading relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. As you know, I've been very clear that uh, uh, following Brexit, we will be looking to establish new rela trading relationships around the globe. I think there are real opportunities for the United Kingdom. We will be going out and seizing those opportunities. But we have a very strong, uh, as I indicated in my own statement with the, some of the figures that I gave, we have a very strong uh, trading relationship with the United States. And we will be looking to ensure that we can maintain that strongest possible relationship into the future. Uh, and on the question that you ask about uh, Hinckley Point, um, I will be doing exactly as uh, you said indeed in your question, Jason, which is, as you know, I'll be looking at all the evidence around the, this issue. Uh, the way I work is that I don't just take a, an instant decision. I actually look at the evidence, take the advice, consider it properly, and then come to a decision. And I've been very clear that I will be doing that and will be taking a decision uh, sometime this month. It is uh, absolutely true that uh, I believed pre-Brexit vote and continue to believe post-Brexit vote that um, the world benefited enormously from the United Kingdom's participation in the EU. But I also said at the time that ultimately this was a decision for the British people and the British people made that decision. 
And I never suggested that we would, quote unquote, punish Great Britain. As you will recall, uh, if you were uh, at that press conference, I was asked about the viability of immediately negotiating a separate trade agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom. Uh, because I think the notion was that uh, the consequences of Brexit uh, would be minimal and we would just go ahead and start uh, uh, lining up a whole bunch of uh, free trade agreements uh, separate and apart from the EU relationship. And my simple point was is that we've put great priority on first the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which now that we have an agreement, uh, we want to put into force that we are also negotiating effectively with the entire EU around uh, the transatlantic uh, trade agreement, or, or TTIP, uh, and those negotiations are proceeding. And so it would not make sense for us to uh, put those efforts aside, uh, particularly at a time when my working assumption was is that if, in fact, the people of the United Kingdom decided to leave the European Union, their first priority would be to renegotiate uh, terms of trade with uh, the economic unit that they sell half of their goods to. Uh, so that, in fact, is, I think, uh, the approach that uh, the Prime Minister uh, is wisely taking, uh, that in a prudent, uh, uh, well-informed fashion uh, with consultations with businesses and stakeholders as well as uh, her counterparts uh, across the channel, they, uh, the, the, uh, the Prime Minister makes a determination about when to invoke Article 50, how those negotiations should proceed. And we are fully supportive of a process that is as uh, as little disruptive as possible uh, so that not just uh, the people of the United Kingdom uh, but uh, people around the world can uh, benefit from continued recovery and economic growth. And what I've committed to uh, Teresa is, is that we will consult closely with her as she and her government move forward uh, with the Brexit negotiations to ensure that we don't see adverse effects uh, in the trading and commercial relationships between the United States and the United Kingdom. Obviously, we have an enormous amount of trade that already takes place. We have a lot of investment uh, between British companies in the United States and U.S. companies in uh, the United Kingdom, and that's not going to stop. And we're going to do everything we can to make sure that uh, the consequences of the decision uh, don't end up uh, unraveling uh, what is already a very strong uh, and robust economic relationship that can uh, become even stronger in the future. But first things first, and the first task is going to be figuring out what Brexit means uh, with respect to Europe, uh, and our first task is making sure that we get first TPP done, but also uh, that we move forward on uh, the TTIP negotiations in which we've already invested uh, a lot of time and effort. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.